Good morning, everyone. Before we get started, uh, does anybody have any announcements they would like to uh, put forth in the church this morning? Yes, Bill. Okay, it's working now. Okay, uh, this is uh, the regular annual ham and shoulder month at the fire department. We, uh, we're running just a little bit late, and the reason is we've been trying to get the prices on the hams and shoulders. They will not give us a price. They won't give us a price until the day we pick them up. So what we're doing, the fire department, they raised the price just up $5, which is a gamble. We may lose on hams and shoulders this year, but we still go do them. Uh, again, the prices, as you know, if you go to the grocery store, everything's high. But what we have this year, whole hams are going to be $60, chopped hams are going to be $70. That's up $5 from last year, which is not much at all. Shoulders, whole shoulders will be $55. Chopped shoulders will be $65. So that's up $5 on each of those. And the extra sauce is $4 a quart. So if you're interested in a ham or shoulder, you can contact me. You can leave a... A message on my phone, I'll call you back and I'll fill out the paperwork. We have to have the money before the paperwork is sent in though. We've got till December the 7th or until 120 hams and shoulders have been sold. So again, it's like everything else. It's first come, first serve. And everybody that's had hams and shoulders from the fire department know how good they are. So anyhow, if you're interested, give me a call. I'll get back with you. And I'll fill out the paperwork and as soon as I get the check or the money, we'll put your uh, receipt in. So uh, again, the hams and shoulders will be good from now until December the 7th, unless we fill up that 120. So thank you very much. Uh, Pickup day, I think, is going to be the 18th. Uh, I'm not for sure. It's going to be that Saturday before Christmas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any any other announcements that need to be made? Yes, Margie. forget about this and I'm the one that helps to do this <laughs> anyway uh, the food pantry we are preparing to move into the building we're excited about that have a good team um, I will be periodically putting in the bulletin um, specific things that we're low on that you might could bring a cam of it and put it in our wagon at the back um, so watch for that um, especially in the bulletin that's emailed. Um, I'll try to have that information. Right now there isn't any in there, but um, in the future I'll probably nudge and maybe one Sunday I may have in the bulletin. We need peanut butter and saltine crackers, for example. The next week then you might could bring to church one jar of peanut butter and, you know, help us out in that way. So be aware of that and kind of watch out for those announcements. Yes, Judy. There's lots of bread and pastry in the back. Bread and pastry in the back. Anyone else? I'd like, oh, yes, uh, Beth. Um. <laughs> I know if we're looking for a volunteer. Miss Sarah needs somebody to take her to therapy tomorrow. And so far, I'm running dry on getting anybody, and I'm volunteering in Greensboro, so. Okay. If anybody could take her. All right. By the end of this service, I'm sure some good Christians are going to come up to you and say, boy, I've been looking forward to an opportunity like this. So, all right. Anyone else? All right, I'd like to announce, uh, Dave Mahoney called me this morning, and uh, unless, D, you want to do it, do you want to announce uh, how you did? All right, say that again over we the did microphone. We 226 OCC Christmas shoe boxes. That's wonderful. And there were four others that kind of dribbled in, and I told them where they could Well, let's give, give them a hand. That's wonderful. 
That's wonderful news. Anyone else with an announcement? Okay, uh, Bible study will not meet this Wednesday due to Thanksgiving. So uh, we usually cancel the night before because we figure maybe you're busy, maybe not. All right, then I would like to turn it over to Bill and he'll open up with uh, praying, praying for our service today. What a beautiful fall morning to come and worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me, if you will. God, we're gathered for worship and to praise your name this morning. We ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit to be witnessed by each and every one of us here this day. God, as we celebrate this week, our Thanksgiving season, let us, as Christians, Give thanks each day, not just on Thanksgiving Day, but every day, because we have so much to be thankful for. Let us never, ever overlook God's grace and bounty. Now, we ask your blessings upon Pastor Steve this morning as he brings us a message of hope and salvation, and we ask your blessings upon our choir as they sing your praises. Now, these things we ask in your name. And let's all stand and greet everyone and then remain standing and we'll have a hymn here in just a minute. Him, hymn number 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. to rectify whenever the you lose your way when you're singing let me let me tell you how to do that you just make up some and uh, and then uh, it's easy to just like sing about your neighbor right next to you 
This poor sinner came to seek you. You know, stuff like that. I hope her sin doesn't rub off on me. You know, things like that. You know, you make it real. Sing gusto. Yeah. I just wish you could have seen your faces. I'm sorry. I, I, I was thinking, oh my gosh, the rabbit missed the hole. That, that dog's going to catch him for sure. That, that shocked look on your face. You know, like, uh-oh, this isn't good. All right. So like when you come up on a squirrel that's just doing like this, you know, going up and down. Sorry, I can't help myself. I'm on a roll now. Okay, at this time, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, ask the ladies, uh, well, Margie has a few words to say about the prayer shawl, and so I'm going to turn it over to her. Okay, I probably didn't need to walk out here. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. We have a, a number of new people in our congregation who are not familiar with our prayer shawl ministry, and so I wanted to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about how it works. You'll see in just a moment um, our team of ladies who work so diligently on these beautiful prayer shawls that we'll be blessing in a moment. After we do that, you'll, if you'll notice on the screen, there are some pictures of various things that we do in the prayer shawl ministry. Not only prayer shawls, uh, we also keep in contact with the ladies shelters, homeless, any way that we can help with things that we make. Um, after this blessing and the prayer shawls will be done, we'll be working on a project of doing blankets for Victory Junction. Uh, we do checkered flag crocheted blankets that are like a checkered flag that go on the beds of each of the children and they get to take it home with them whenever they're there. Victory Junction has to have a thousand blankets every year uh, along with some, I think they have stuffed animals too, but we do the blankets to try to help them out and then we'll do a trip down there and present those to him later this year. So. Um, why would we want a prayer shawl? The, this ministry is for everyone in this church and beyond this church. If you know of anyone that you would like to witness to, someone that you know is hurting, someone that, that you would like to have something to remind to them that Jesus loves them, that the church is praying for them. It doesn't have to be sickness. There can be all kinds of reasons to want to bring comfort to another person. So this team is only the beginning. God gave us the skills to be able to do this. Steve will bless them. We'll, the team will come up and we'll pray over these. They'll be put in the narthex, narthex at the back of the church. Please feel free to take one. You do not need to ask permission. They are now the churches. Um, they are ready for you to go out and witness and uh, bless someone with a prayer shawl. If you don't see something that's appropriate for the person that you want to take something to, let us know. We'll do our best to try to get something the color that you want and so forth. Now back there with the prayer shawls are handmade cards of various kinds with scriptures and prayers for different purposes. Take a card that, and attach it to the prayer shawl if you take one. Also, you'll see there are many beautiful colors up here. They mean different things in a prayer shawl. So in the back, in the um, notebook that we have back there, is this chart that will let you know what the different colors mean. I will not go over all that. You don't want me to do that right now. But uh, you certainly, if you're interested in seeing, wonder what this red means, if I get a red one, or what the silver one means, or whatever. You can look at that information. You'll notice on a lot of the prayer shawls, there are crosses that are crocheted or knitted in or applied to them. A lot of times we use stitches that are called a trinity stitch. 
Um, and we all know what Trinity means in the Methodist Church, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So as we crochet or knit, we are saying that and we are praying. Every meeting that we have, we have devotions, prayer time. We lift up those that we know need prayer in our community or in our church. So this is an outreach program to give you a tool to take and comfort um, anyone. And this can go far and wide. We've got prayer shawls all the way from California to North Carolina. So, and I think some even have gone across the ocean, haven't they, Eva? <laughs> I think we have some in Germany. So um, uh, don't forget that. You don't need to find me and find out if you can get a prayer shawl. No, these are our church disciples' prayer shawls, a tool for you. You are free to go and get one at any time. So now if the uh, prayer shawl team will come down front, we will have Steve to complete our service. All right, let's pray. Gracious and loving God, as these hands are laid upon these prayer shawls, we give you thanks for those skills and gifts that you have given them to do this and to be an active agent of your Holy Spirit, to touch the lives of people that are, in some cases, they're frightened. Other times, maybe they're grieving. Still others might be uncertain of the future. Maybe there are things happening in their family that uh, needs to be addressed and they're just needing a, a direction. So Lord, we thank you that this can be an agent of the Spirit of God to bring healing and comfort and just to wrap them in your loving arms and your presence. And we pray this, Lord, as these are sent out, they will touch the lives of others. And we pray it in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, ladies. I'd like to give you now uh, to the church uh, the opportunity to lift up anyone that you would like to pray for. Today, as we go to our Lord in our morning prayer, are there any prayer requests? Pat, I see you, your hands up. Oh, hold on just a second. Somebody's coming your way. Well, see, good thing they didn't come earlier. Um, please keep my youngest granddaughter, Emily Bosch, in your prayers. She's going through a real rough patch. And we're all praying a lot. Tonight. Okay. Thank you, Pat. Who else? Sarah? hospital with heart problems and they had to put several stents in him so if we keep him in our prayers I'd appreciate it sure certainly will thank you Sarah yes uh, I went uh, most of y'all know Sadie my granddaughter that's come to church here uh, along with Pat here our young people need prayer she just turned 14 years old and I was up there for her birthday she said Nana you wouldn't believe what they're forcing us to learn in school now, this gender thing and everything else, and this child is confused. And to mm -hmm. the point, she's got to go see a psychologist. It's messed her up that bad. So y'all keep all of our young people in prayer. We, you know, us growing up, we wasn't faced with these things like these children are today. They really need our prayer. Absolutely. I agree, Sherry. Let's be in prayer for her. Kyle. I uh, just pray for my family. Uh, you know, as most of you know, uh, we lost our father last week. And uh, just pray for my family that in the grieving process and all the things that follow. That's it. Thanks. 
Thank you, and we're sorry for the loss of your dad. And um, so we'll be praying for you and, and your whole family. I'd like to add to the list Tommy Cato. Uh, Tommy was telling me this morning that they've been doing some um, local surgery on uh, some skin cancer, and it's just gotten really deep, and there's a lot of questions that are not answered. So let's pray for his healing and that God's hand will heal that cancer. Yes, Joan. Uh, pray for my daughter, Saber, and her whole family for salvation. Absolutely. Anyone else? Yes, Linda. I am especially aware of our choir, who been many have been dealing with lots of things. The, the two that come to my mind first are Kim Davis and... Um, Christy is also the whole family still dealing with a, some kind of a bug that, that that frightens them, and also Pauline and David, and the country and everybody else. And Ju Julie, and can Julie. you pray pray for Julie? Joni, I have a praise this morning as as well as a request. Um, I told you that my granddaughter Addison had the fundraiser for the little girl from Denton with cancer. Um, the little girl is having a tough time battling leukemia. They were supposed to come home two weeks ago, and they're still doing more tests because she still spikes fevers. Um, on a positive note, thanks to the many people, many, I can never, ever mention all the names, but we were able to raise over $5,000 to help with this little girl's medical That's bills. wonderful. Good. Good deal. Anyone else? <coughs> um, we need to let everyone know tonight is church conference here at the church. We'll probably do it in the fellowship hall or yes. here in the fellowship hall, 7 o'clock. So if you would like to come to church conference and see that step in the process this evening, come and join us. We need the prayers for Jim and Debbie Russell. They both have Parkinson's disease. The dad has been in the care facility for a while, and the mom is progressing. And uh, we'll be sharing Thanksgiving with them, minus him this year. And just appreciate all your prayers for them. Their family's going through a lot right now. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Keith. Anyone else? Uh, Judy. If you'll remember my mother, she's having trouble with her hip. Okay. We'll do that. Thank you. Anyone else? Nita had Nancy to the park. Yes. She's coming. She's coming home today. Oh, that's good news. Great. Nancy's coming home today. That's good news. Put all those cards away, Bill. She's coming home. <laughs> yeah. I just want you to mention that I think I can talk loud enough. No, no. I have taken dinner to Nancy uh, almost every evening. She's been over there about nine days now at Mount Vista. And I was compelled each time I left to, to stop by the caregivers and pat them on the shoulder or tap them on the arm and thank them. The caregivers need our prayers. Absolutely. Thank you, Bill. Folks, I want you to be in prayer for a man. I met a man yesterday who is homeless, and uh, his name is James. And I just would like to lift up James in our prayer this morning. Yes, Winford. I have two unspokens. All right. Any other unspoken today? All right. All right, let's bow our heads and let's go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Loving God, we thank you so much for so many things. Every year we, we get to this place where Thanksgiving is upon us and, and we all look forward to those opportunities we have to see our family and to just to have those reunions, Lord. They're always a happy time. And uh, we're grateful, Lord, for all the blessings that our family uh, just 
to, brings to all of us in our life. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, we can come together and remember those things that uh, we are blessed with in our country. Lord, so many times we, don't, we take them for granted until they seem to slip away from us. And uh, then we realize just how important and how, how important they are in our lives and in the life of our country. We pray, O oh God, for all those who are leaders, that your Holy Spirit will stir their hearts and to bring them to a place of, of salvation in their life. We pray, Lord, for the churches throughout our land that we will be the vessel of the Holy Spirit and, and not just uh, trying to accommodate um, a culture that has been ravaged by sin. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will be uh, uh, courageous in our faith, that we will speak truth and, and not be frightened of uh, persecution for speaking that truth. Heavenly Father, for our church family, I give you thanks. The many blessings that they are to so many people <clears throat> in our community. We pray, Lord, for those that are grieving, who have lost someone in their life to death. And Lord, even though we know that death is not the end of all things, it still is painful to go through. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bring some peace and those whose hearts are grieving on this day. We thank you, Lord, for uh, our community. Lord, we are planted here in this community, and we're grateful for the people that live here, and we pray for them. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your Holy Spirit will move throughout this entire uh, region and that a great awakening will come about and we pray, O oh Lord, that uh, you can use us and all the other churches to be the vessel of your Holy Spirit uh, to bring revival in our land. We pray for peace in this world. We pray for peace in our country. And we pray all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All our children. Absolutely. At this time, I'd like to ask uh, our ushers if they would come forward and let's receive his tithes and our offerings. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for giving to the church. We pray, O oh Lord, that these gifts of money will be used to do uh, the good work of the kingdom. We pray, O oh Lord, that it will be touching hearts and that your grace and the story of the gospel will open the hearts of those who in our community desperately are looking for answers and looking for healing or truth. We thank you, Lord, for giving. It is an honor and a privilege to give. And we lift this prayer up in Jesus' name. Amen.
is our sixth week of, in a row of going through the churches in Asia Minor uh, throughout uh, those uh, first uh, few verse, uh, chapters in uh, Revelation. I thank you for being patient. I hope you've enjoyed uh, this series uh, of uh, looking at the uh, churches and the letter of, of, that was written uh, actually uh, by John, but given to him through Jesus Christ. And it is quite amazing if you look back at church history, which, um, and you can see how each, uh, we, have the, we have the advantage of 2,000 years since the crucifixion of Jesus and the birth of the church. And so we can now look back in the year 2021 and we can see how each one of those churches that Jesus chose to give this revelation, each one are significant not only to them at that time in the first century, but also throughout all of church history, even the meanings of the church's names are significant that line up with different uh, time periods in uh, church history. Now you can say that's a coincidence if you'd like, but I, I, it just reinforces to me as a Christian that I've always believed that Revelation was one of those ongoing books. It, uh, it, it's, as time goes on, then more is revealed. And uh, I think that's exactly what we are seeing you know, we looked at uh, Ephesus in the beginning, and it was the apostolic church, and it, and it means desired. We looked at Smyrna, uh, and it was the persecuted church, and it meant myrrh. Uh, Pergamum, uh, in 3, 313 through 590, became the state church when Constantine was converted, and it became thoroughly married where state and church became one and the same. Uh, Theatira in 590 through 1517 was the time where the papal church came on the scene and the only church was uh, the Catholic church. And we see that perpetual sacrifice is what that uh, name means. And they were emphasizing transubstantiation and and uh, pardoning people of their sins that were caught in purgatory. And then in 1517, we see where uh, Martin Luther came on the scene. And if you look at the church of Sardis and you, you see that it is the reformed church, it was those, what it means is those escaping out of. And so it was when uh, the reformation began and the Protestant church came on the scene. And, uh, and so that was a, a time that uh, we see Martin Luther being the, uh, uh, where God used him to begin that process. Then we see the Church of Philadelphia, which is a church of, which is known as the missionary church. Uh, and uh, you know, Philadelphia is a, is, a sand, is a meaning of brotherly love. There was a great outpouring all over the known world at that time, probably not no, like no other time, when the reformers uh, like John Calvin and John Wesley and Charles Wesley and John Winthrop and uh, where you had all these different uh, uh, reformers that brought about the great awakening and uh, throughout not only Europe and England, which was the great revival of, of England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, with Methodism, but you also had them come to the United States and in the Northeast there uh, you had a beginning of the Great Awakening where camp meetings came into play in the wilderness and people started to come to Jesus by the thousands. They said they used to run to the altar whenever an invitation was given. And that season of the missionary church uh, sort of started to wane around 1900. And that's when liberalism became a part of the scene of the education of the church. And that's what we're going to talk about. This is the last church. It was a season where 
German theologians and others uh, in other areas of Europe started to bring about the textual criticism of the Bible. They also would then dive into what we call systematic theology. And systematic theology, believe me, if you ever got into a, a reading of one of the systematic theologians, you have to learn the language to understand what they're saying. And so education became, uh, which has always been a part of a clergy's life, just like a doctor or a lawyer, uh, your most educated people in the community in a lot, most towns were a doctor, a lawyer, and the minister. And so it became a part of who we are. Now in the Methodist church, which we are, we have a system, a method. That's why we're called Methodist. We have a method for everything. And so to be ordained an elder in the Methodist church, there are certain requirements that you have to fulfill. One is you have to get an undergraduate degree, and then you have to get a graduate degree. Then you have to go before the board of ordained ministry. You will then be on a, a period of a trial, like a, a season of probation for two years after you have finished seminary. And then you will go before this committee and you will be judged on all these different areas and you have to pass that. If you don't pass it the first time, then you have to come back a year later and do it again. It's sort of like a lawyer going for their, their boards. I, uh, is that what you call it? Bar exam. The bar exam. And so it's, it's sort of the same type of animal. And so, you know, you go through these things, and then you're recognized by the authority of the church. You are then ordained to be a minister in full connection as an elder in the church. And that series of, of, of things take, takes uh, almost nine years from start to finish. And so it's a long process. So we have seen these, uh, the emphasis, and you know, I'm all in favor of education, folks. I think education's a good thing. I think that we need to have a broad understanding of even things that we don't agree with and, and that things that are you know, that you're going to face in life. And, and so I think it is a good thing to have education. But I also believe that there is, uh, there's still room to do those requirements that the church asked us to do. But there's also a place where we allow the Spirit of God to be the one true uh, divine force or uh, source of power in our lives. It's more than just uh, quoting verses. It's more than understanding some kind of scriptural deeper truth. It is more than just having uh, diplomas or, or your certificates on, uh, on the wall. It is about releasing the power that you think you have and allowing the Spirit of God to use you in a, in a very divine way, in His way, seeking His will, seeking His word, seeking His interpretations. Because I can promise you, if you want to, it's like philosophy. You can get into theology and you can split hairs and you can create and recreate and you can move and change and you can manipulate the Holy Scriptures to come about to an agreement with your ideals. But are those God's ideals? Is that what His message is? Because if you look at the apostolic church that we've been looking at all along, you'll see that they were the desired church. They were the one that was most in tune with the power of the Holy Spirit. It was just at the time of the birth of the church. And whenever Peter got up and spoke, he spoke to people from all over the region, and they all spoke different languages. And what happened? The Holy Spirit of God took over, and every one of them understood exactly what he was preaching in their own language. 
Now see, there are those theologians that would try to manipulate those passages and try to prove that that's impossible. It's sort of like the feeding of the 5,000. There are those that would like to uh, have us believe that that really didn't happen, it's just a story. There are those that would like you to understand that, well, Adam and Eve never really existed. They're just symbols of man and woman. There are those that, that would even debate with us whether or not God created the earth in seven days because they will take the science and evolution instead that God did it in seven days. See, see, the, see how we are going all over the place. So there's a lot of room in theology like philosophy where you can walk in, talk in, in circles and never get anywhere. And so here we are. We're going to look at the church of Laodicea. This is a church that really had a lot, a lot of problems. A whole lot of problems. So let's read this morning what uh, these few verses tell us about the church of Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Some translations say vomit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen. I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. Just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so is the reading of God's holy word this morning. Let's look at the church of Laodicea. Laodicea was a wealthy city, number one. It was in the area of Colossia. It was about 95 miles east of Ephesus. In Laodicea, they were known for... Uh, being a, like a banking town. It's like uh, Charlotte is known for being a banking city. Laodicea was known for the same type of thing. They were affluent. They had a lot of money, a lot of resources. They were the envy of a lot of people. They always looked like they had everything they needed, and that was sort of the goal that some people look to in the Roman Empire is to live like the people of Laodicea. And the church was no different. The church in itself was fairly wealthy because it had a lot of people that were wealthy in the church. And it was a church that was, uh, really didn't take a stand on anything one way or the other. Because that's so risky, isn't it? If you ever take a stand on something, guess what ends up happening? Somebody on the opposite side of that, they're going to attack you, especially in this day and time. You know, with social media, if you put yourself out there, believe me, you set yourself up for criticism. There's no doubt about it. If you try to use social media to witness your faith, you will get condemnations. I have a daughter that does it. And she, she witnesses on the Facebook. She sends messages out, uplifting messages. And you would be surprised how many strangers who read it 
are, are disgusted with it. They're, they seem almost angry at any one who is a Christian that's wanting to share scriptural truths and hope and the love of God, the belief in God. Maybe their life is so miserable and they feel like this has never happened in my life and I'm sick and tired of these people from church telling me how wonderful everything is. And that's not exactly what's happening. What it does is it, when you bring the scripture into it, it reveals truth. It's going to get a response, folks. Whenever you bring the truth before a congregation, whether they're on the social media, whether they're sitting in a church, or wherever you are in private conversation, you're going to get a response. Some responses are positive, some are negative. It goes with the territory. Because there are people that are trying to justify their life. And if my life is a mess, or if I'm living in rebellion against God, what am I going to do? I'm going to look for any kind of scripture, if I'm talking to a Christian, that's going to validate me living out my life the way I want to. And I'm going to get angry at a Christian who's going to reveal the problems with my, life's, my lifestyle. And especially when the Bible does it. So when the Bible does it, then it puts a lot of pressure on me. So what do we do? We do, like what I said earlier, we start to split hairs. We find scriptures. We put this one over here with this one over here, and we almost make a joke about it. You know, it's like, what, who is the first martyr in the Bible? The first martyr was Stephen. How did Stephen die? He was stoned. Well, you can use that as a joke. I've done it. <laughs> That's why I know. <coughs> I say, well, my name is Stephen, and there have been times in my life I was stoned. So see, we can, we can play this game all day long. And, you know, we make light of things because we don't want to, a lot of times, face the things in our life that need to change. And now in this time in which you have a canceled culture, a culture that now has become hostile, hostile to anyone that doesn't agree with them, and they try to ruin your life, they don't just disagree with you, they try to cancel you out. They try to ruin your life. So there's a huge price to pay whenever you speak truth that comes from Scripture. And you're the one they're going to take it out on if you are the messenger. So what's the safe thing to do as Christians? And it's like anyone sitting in the pew today. The safe way is not talk. Not say anything. Don't take an issue one way or the other. Don't take a stand one way or the other. Especially on those hot button items like abortion. You take that one, you're going to get a reaction. You know, so we have these things that are happening. There are moral issues that are happening in our country. These are issues that really touch us where we are. And so what the church is wanting to do and did at that time is it started to find a comfortable place, a comfortable place where it wasn't controversial. That's what we call lukewarm. It is where you, you're, not take, you're not either hot or you're not cold. You're one, you know, it says you, you, you're just going to be in the middle well, the Bible teaches us that it would be, be better for you that if you were either hot or cold. I promise you, folks, if you've ever witnessed to anybody your faith, the hardest person in the world to witness to, the hardest person in the world to get their attention, the hardest person in the world to bring them to Jesus Christ as Savior is a religious person. It is. Someone that was brought up in church. Someone that knows just enough scripture to be dangerous. 
Someone who is not going to take a stand one way or the other. They're going to take a stand that's always going to be to their advantage. And the sad part about it is they think they're a good person. And God's got a special place in heaven for them. Well, you know, what's the Bible tell us about being a good person? The Bible tells us Jesus said, no one is good but the Father. And so um, immediately, what does that tell me? We have all fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us. It doesn't matter how educated you are or how uneducated you are. It doesn't matter what your culture is or what it's not. It doesn't matter who your family's name is or, or, or who you know that can influence others. It's not about your job. None of those things. We have all fallen short, the Bible tells us. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And how is it that we are saved? We use the word saved. That's a, that's a fire word right there. That one, that one sets people off. If you use born again or saved, immediately, bam! Oh my goodness, there's one of those evangelical fanatics. But how is a person saved? Is it through our works? Paul writes about this all through his letters. It is not the law that saves us. Jesus saves us because who fulfilled the law? It wasn't us. It was Him. It is through the cross of Jesus. It is through a surrender of your own pride and your own spirit. It is letting your guard down and being vulnerable before God. It is confessing sin in your life. It is calling out sin what it is. It is admitting it and saying, Lord, I am lost without you. I have no hope. But if you are living in a lukewarm world, we are more concerned about our comfort. We're more concerned about the building. We're more concerned about all of these other things that distract from our spirit. And so we are deceived into believing that somehow I can ride this through and I'll just keep my mouth shut and not say anything because I don't want people to dislike me. I'll just keep quiet and I'll just be religious. These people don't know they're lost. This is the sad part. They think because they have good attendance at church and that they see themselves as a good person, or they have a fairly even-minded philosophy in life, or they're very accepting of all people, that they're just a good guy or a good gal, somehow that will play with God. And I assure you, the Bible does not teach that. The Bible teaches us that we have to admit that we're sinners. We have to confess our sins. And then we have to open up our heart to let the Savior in. He doesn't want religion. We already talked about this a few weeks ago. He wants relationship. He knocks at the door of your heart, the Bible tells us. Why? Because He wants to come into your life. He doesn't want to be up on a cross somewhere so you can go and uh, and just look at it. He wants to walk through your soul and dine with you, and get to know you, and you Him. And people struggle with this. They have a hard time, because you can't control those things. Those are all a gift of God. See, it's not something that I earn. I can't earn it, no matter how hard I try. I can't just ride the pew and be quiet all my life. Never be a person of conviction. Never speak truth because we're afraid we're going to offend somebody. My goodness. And see, what's happened now is that the church, 2,000 years later in Laodicea, is exactly the same. We are the church of Laodicea. In church history, it's like a lot of the fire of the Holy Spirit of God to go into all the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus to bring the lost to Jesus Christ as they did in the Great Awakening. All of that seems like it's diminishing as time goes on. 
See, we have now received uh, not so much the power of the Holy Spirit, but the power through our intellect to manipulate the Scripture, to appease what we want to hear. And we're very good at it. And so what happens is, when we see things happening in our country today, and we, you, know, I, you, know, you hear Sherry talking about her granddaughter. Now tell me, Sherry, why should a small child have to deal with something like that? What does the Bible tell us? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. His original intention in the beginning was He first created man. And so that man would not be alone, He created woman out of the rib of man. Now there are people who say, well, that didn't really happen, preacher, you know that. Really? You mean, are you trying to tell me the God that created all the universe and all the stars and all the galaxies and all life all over everywhere can't do that? Well, good luck with that. <laughs> it's sort of like, well, there really wasn't a worldwide flood. Really? Well, I mean, evolution doesn't teach that. We start with a single-cell amoeba, and we evolve over billions of years until we are upright and walking on this earth. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds very scientific. We're going to follow the science. Boy, I love it. I am so tired of hearing that one. We're going to follow the science. Well, I have nothing against science. Guess who created science? The Creator. Yeah, I know. It's not comfortable, is it? He says that this lukewarm Christianity is nauseating because it's complacent, self-satisfying, spiritual poverty, and is stricken down. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he thinks of it. It would be better if you were cold. I promise you, the people that are living like the devil and would you be considered cold will listen to the gospel quicker than those who are lukewarm. Because those who are lukewarm think they're already religious enough. They don't think they need it. It's sort of like whenever we are affluent. When we have plenty, and then more than plenty, we have everything we want. And I promise you, it's in those days that you pray the least. You don't pray the more. You pray less. The time when people really fall to their knees and really bend that knee, even if they're arthritic like me, the time that we fall before God and be humbled is when we are in a time of want, when we're being persecuted, when we don't have an answer, when our hearts are broken, when we're beaten down, that's when we pray, folks, and you know it. But when things are going fine and great, we think we got it covered. And that's exactly what lukewarm believes. They believe they got it covered. They think that everything's fine. We are being bombarded in our country. Bombarded with all kinds of <clears throat> cultural, new cultural norms. Right is wrong and wrong is right. Things that we know obviously that are right and wrong have been switched. And now, if you stand on that truth, you will be persecuted. If you just state the obvious, you will be persecuted. Why? Because lukewarm is trying to justify spiritual depravity. They're trying to justify their lostness and claim that it is, means that they're saved. They are trying to tell God what to do. And there's no greater arrogance we are telling the Almighty God His Word is wrong because it was just written by a man 2,000 years ago. We're trying to tell God that, Lord, I want you to go 
on my behalf, my way. We're not seeking Him. We're not humbly coming before Him. If we're lukewarm, what we're doing is we are playing God. There are even, even ministers, I've heard them preach this, that because we are made in the image of God, then we are all little gods. That's the truth. I've heard them preach that. That because you are one of Adam's offspring, you are a little god. And because you're a little god, you have power that was given to you from your father. And they misuse the scripture so badly. They'll say the Holy Spirit becomes that power that makes you a little god. This is so, so the arrogance of that and the stupidity and the sad part about it. People love to hear that because little gods live in palaces. Little gods have plenty. Little gods never suffer. Little gods never have to serve. Somebody serves them. Little gods can live high on the hog. Little gods can justify their greed. Little gods don't have to answer to you or anyone else. And that fits the paradigm dead on. Lukewarmness. And so what's the Bible tell us? You'd be better off to be cold. You'd be better off just being completely cold, lost, angry, bitter, rebelling. Because it is people like this that will come to the realization when the Holy Spirit of God moves in their life and in their heart. They can come and say, I confess, Lord, I'm lost. Lukewarm's not going to do that. So it's better that you either be hot, that means filled with the Spirit of God, you know that you are a sinner saved by grace, you walk humbly before God, you're not seeking self-righteousness. Let me tell you something, folks. There's not a single soul that's ever walked on this earth that was self-righteous made it to heaven. And that doesn't, I don't have to be a God to know that. Self-righteousness will not get you there. You will miss the mark. You're in for a huge surprise if you think doing religious things with a self-righteous spirit somehow is going to get you in good with God. The Bible wants us to die to self. He want, the Bible teaches us, even in our baptism, that we die to self and we're raised a new person. Nicodemus, who was an educated man, an educated rabbi, was intrigued with Jesus. And he went to him during the night because he didn't want anybody to know that he was meeting with him. A little lukewarm there, don't you think? And he says, what must one do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? They had this big discussion. And when Jesus got to the point, he says, you need to be born anew. You need to be born again. Nicodemus was going, what? You know... Jesus, I'm intrigued with that. I'm hearing what you're saying, but I'm not understanding what you're saying. You mean going back into your mother's womb? You know, Jesus is shaking his head saying, Nicodemus, you're an educated man. You are a rabbi. You are well thought of all through this region. You are a leader. And you're trying to tell me you don't understand what I'm telling you. You know better than that. So Nicodemus' life changed when he realized that his religion wasn't going to take him there. Trying to follow the law wasn't going to get him there. That it was through the grace of God, through faith, through the mercy of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of the cross. It is through Christ Jesus because He is the way and the truth and the life. The Bible tells, talks about He is the truth. He is what is true. Amen. In the beginning part of this where it says the words of amen, that actually amen means so be it or so mote it be. And it also means that which is true. 
Jesus is that which is true. If you want to know the Father, I told you this last week. If you want to know the Father, know Jesus. If you want to know the will of, of God, look at what Jesus teaches us. If you want to know salvation, go to Jesus. Because the Father and the Son are one. And then He will fill you with His third person, or the third personality, and that's His Spirit. And we can share in a relationship because Jesus stands at the door and He knocks. And if you open the door, you will be saved. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what you do. It's not about how well you do or don't do. It is truly a gift, a gift from God Almighty to humanity. It doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter if you're black or white. You know, there's only one race in this world, and that's the human race. We're all children of God. It doesn't matter where you come from or what language you speak. This Savior died for you to set you free. That God loves you and he opens the door to heaven itself for any that desire it. And you say, well, how do I do that? You confess, you accept. It's a gift you don't earn. You confess, you accept, just like a child, just like a little child. And he does the rest. And then he fills you with his spirit, and you grow in the faith. And then you become not cold or lukewarm, you become hot. You become a follower of Jesus. You become somebody that loves the Lord Jesus, that wants to serve Christ, that wants to be a vessel of the Holy Spirit. You become like the Apostle Paul who said, I am the worst of sinners, but yet God used him to reach people for 2,000 years. His writings have touched the lives of people. He used Simon Peter and John and Matthew and others, women and men. He used them. He says, buy from me gold refined by fire. What he is saying is, for re this is a, a symbol of removing sin from one's life. And that, that sin is removed by Christ Jesus. He says, I want to dress you in white robes. What does that mean? You see that in the Bible. He says, I want to, to put white robes on you. The white robes is a symbol of purity, innocence. In other words, I was guilty, but now I'm innocent. And it's a gift of God. It's something that Jesus gives us. He wraps us with a white robe. And we all become his children. What a wonderful God we have, folks. What a wonderful God we have. No matter where you are in life, no, no, no matter how far you've fallen, no matter how many times you fail, our God is always waiting, always calling always pursuing every one of us. His desire is that everybody go into the kingdom of heaven, that nobody be lost. But unfortunately, we see things happening today. And I'm going to close with this, that are upsetting us. We see it happening in our world. We see things moving very quickly now. Like the Bible says, a symbolism of like when a woman's birth pangs come on, they just come on all of a sudden. Then all of a sudden, all of, we see all this stuff going on. And you can't tell me you don't. I know you do. And it's so quick, you don't even have time to react. And you're saying, what's happening here? He's trying to get our attention. He says, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. He says, I reprove and I discipline those who I love. He doesn't do it to hurt us. He does it because he loves us. The apostate church is one whose appearance was one who was a follower of Christ or a believer. And then later, they consciously and intentionally repudiate 
their belief in Christ, and they leave the covenant community. That's what the word apostate means. It means that you choose to leave. You choose. Why would you do that? But people do. The Bible tells us all through the greatest problem in the end days is that, that people's hearts will grow cold. Love will grow cold. And they will refuse to repent. Refuse it. How many times have we seen this over and over again? It's like a liar telling you, I'm going to keep on lying and I'm never going to stop. I refuse to repent. I refuse to change. I'm not going to. The apostate church is a church that has just sold its soul and it will not speak truth. It recreates truth. And the Bible's very clear. My dear brothers and sisters, I ask that you listen to the Spirit of God in these days. I ask that you surrender your whole self to Him. I ask that you be humbled by the power of the Holy Spirit and accept this wonderful gift He is offering. I can't force you to do it. I can't shame you into doing it, nor should I. I just present to you the truth as the Bible teaches us. The apostate church is the last church before Jesus returns. All through church history, we have seen through these three chapters how we have evolved and now where we are. The apostate church is the one that will lead us into the great tribulation. I'm sorry about that. You and I are in it. We're in that generation. Christ is coming. I don't know when. That's up to him. But we need to be getting our spiritual house in order. And if you haven't, I beg you to seek him and seek his word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though it is difficult to be disciplined by you, it is hard, Lord. It hurts when you speak truth to our sin and it exposes us for who we really are. But Heavenly Father, it's the only way anything will ever change. It's the only way that we can be humbled to come to you. It's when we are exposed for who we really are. It's the only way that a person, man or woman, can truly be honest with you and not be lukewarm. It is when we fall to our knees and we realize, oh Lord, I have not got all this figured out in my head. I am playing games with my soul. I am playing games with eternity. So today, Lord, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And I hope you'll pray this prayer this morning. Dear Jesus, I am your child. And Father, I want to love you. I want to believe. I want to share in this wonderful gift that you're offering to me. I'm sorry, Jesus, for all I've done that has kept me from you. And I did it to myself. No one forced me. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you will open, well, I will open the door of my heart so that you can come in. And I'm not going to have religion, Lord. I don't need religion. I need a Savior. I need that relationship with the Son of God. That every day I walk on this earth from this day forth, 
we'll have time together to talk. And you can tell me what you want me to do. And I can trust you. And you will give me the power to do it through your spirit. Lord, we pray for the church in our country and all over the world. Some areas of the world, we know it's just almost completely dead. Hollowed shelves. Buildings where no one goes. We pray, Lord, for the church in our country who are trying to appease sin. They're just trying to appease the evil one. He has crept into their midst and they allowed it. He has deceived and he has lied and they have believed it. And they do it with a self-righteous attitude. Oh God, let us be faithful servants all the way to the end until you come in all your glory. Let us be faithful servants saved by the blood of the Lamb and will be raised again when death comes calling to a life that is eternal. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all stand and sing our closing hymn. Come, ye thankful people, come. If you need time with the Lord and you need to just come and to pray, please, please feel free to do so. If you've never made that commitment to Jesus Christ, you've never really given your heart, do that today. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Let's all sing together.
friends. I hope that as you go your way, you will depend on the power of the Spirit of God to guide your steps. And until we can meet back again here at this church house, I pray that the Holy Spirit will fill you, empower you, and that the Lord God will put his angels guard around you and keep you safe. Until we meet again, in the name of Christ our Lord, amen.